So now we're ready to define the notion of a function from a set theoretic. Uh, prior to saying that, though, I should remind uh, the viewer here the definition of a relation from this set theoretic point of view. Uh, in the previous video, we had remind we reminded the viewer about the notion of a Cartesian product, right? The Cartesian product of A and B will be the set of all ordered pairs from things coming from A and things coming from B. A relation is simply just a subset of this ordered pair. And so we would say that R is a relation on A and B as this subset of the ordered pair. And so the, the, the relation R we want to think of is as a set of ordered pairs. It might not be the proper our subset, so we don't necessarily expect all ordered pairs to be in there, although that is an acceptable, poss acceptable possibility. Uh, so the relation is just the set of ordered pairs, and we say that uh, an element A, which is in capital A, and little b, which is in capital B, we say that A is related to B if that ordered pair a comma b is inside of the relationship and typically this will be denoted by a r b we put the relation uh, as a symbol between the two two elements which are related say a r a r b now of course if a comma b is an order pair that's not in the relationship we would say this happens if and only if a r b um, a r slash b so a a not r b we, we can say something like that as well. All right, so that's a relationship. That's a very broad definition. There's lots of different types of relationships one could study. Right now, our focus is going to be on the special function relationship. Uh, but in future videos, we'll talk about equivalence relationships. We'll talk about partial orders, uh, which are different relationships on, on between two sets. And of course, we could also take that the set A and B are actually the same set. And so you could have relationships of a set on itself. Uh, but for the moment being, let's focus on the function relationship. So take two sets, A and B, and again, the order does matter, right? A is the first one, B is the second one. So we say that a relation, which we're going to call it F here, F for function, we say that a relation F on A and B is a function, or sometimes it's called a mapping, and the direction does matter. It's a, it's a, it's a function from A to B, so there is this idea of flow right here, A flows to B here. And so we will denote that indicating that flow. F is a function from A to B, or sometimes you'll see people draw the little F above the arrow. That's okay too, if you want to do that. So what's a function? It's a relationship from A to B such that for each element A inside of the first set, capital A, there exists exactly one ordered pair of a comma B inside of F right there. So for every element in the set A, there's exactly one ordered pair that has A as the first parameter right there. In which case we would then say that A is related to B. And the way we typically denote that's in the following way. So if A comma B is inside of the relationship F, then we would say that F of A equals B. And so this symbol f of a, we can use interchangeably with b here. And since there's exactly one ordered pair that has a in the first slot, there's never going to be a time where I say f of a equals b1 and f of a equals b2. The notion of a function requires this uniqueness for the elements in the first, in the first slot. Now this element b, which is connected to a, we refer to this as the image of a. And like we saw, it's denoted as f of a. And we also might write this in the following manner. We might say, if and only if, F maps A to B. So we draw this little arrow, but there's always this vertical line attached to the left side of the arrow showing the flow right there. Um, you, can, you can drop the F if by context it's clear which function we're talking about. If there's multiple functions, then you probably need to write F right there so we can see it. Uh, a little bit of vocabulary that the set that we are leaving that is the set that the first set A, we refer to this as the domain of the function. And then the second set B that you're flowing into, that is commonly referred to as the codomain of the function. And so if we re express the idea of a function, what we mean is a function is a function if domain has a unique image. Every element of the domain has something associated to it. That means everyone in the domain is connected to is related to some element of b 
at least one element, but also at most one element. Now, one has to be careful here. Uh, when it comes to the definition of a function, we are specifying a uniqueness of relationship on things in the domain. In terms of the codomain, we have no connection there whatsoever, at least not for the definition of a function. It could be that multiple elements in the domain relate to the same element in the codomain. There could be like some A1, A2, uh, A2 there, that both map to the same element B. We don't forbid that when we define a function. Uh, we just need that f of a1 is defined, that could be b. We need f of a2 to be defined, that could also be b. So there's no uniqueness of image in the definition of a function. Also, there could be things in the codomain, right? Uh, you have things in the codomain over here. This is our codomain b. You have some domain over here a. It could be that this thing is mapping to this one, this one maps to this one, this one maps to this one, right? Um, and there could be someone in the codomain that is not related to anyone in the domain. The function definition doesn't require that. The stipulation is uniqueness on relation for the domain. There's nothing about uniqueness of relation on the codomain. We'll actually come back to that issue a little bit later in the next video. And because of this, it often makes sense to define the image of the function. Now we're overloading this word a little bit. We've talked about the image of an element in the domain, but the image of the function, this is sometimes called the range, this will be the set of all images of of the elements, right? So as A ranges over the elements of the domain, you take the set of all images. That set is also called the image of A. Sorry, the image of F. Often it's denoted F of the whole set, the whole domain A right there. Uh, in like calculus settings, pre-calculus settings, this is often called the range. But as people often use the word range to describe the image of the function and the codomain of the function, in higher mathematics, we often step away from the word range because, again, it can be a little bit confusing for more elementical settings. So we'll typically call this the, the image of the set, the image of the function, I should say. And so the codomain and the image are not typically the same set, although it is possible that is the case, but that's not always the case. Um, if we ever have, if, if we have any subset of the domain, uh, for example, let's say that y is some subset of the domain. We can then talk about the image of y, f of y. Um, this, of course, will naturally be a subset of the of the image of the whole function, in which case we would define this set right here to be the set of all values f of y, where y is inside of y, right? So the image of the function is if you take the image of the entire domain, but any subset of the domain, we could also talk about the image of that set. And this process is also reversible if we take these a subset of the codomain, call it x, we can talk about the reverse image or the pre-image, that's the word we're going to use here. Where the pre-image, this is also something that we don't often talk about in like calculus notions of function, which is honestly a poor notion of functions. We'll get into that a little bit more in this lecture. The pre-image, which we'll write f inverse of x, this would be the set of all elements a in the domain such that f of a is, e is inside the x right there. So we think of x as a set of images. It's part of the codomain, right? We want to think of x as a set of images. And so the pre-image is going to be the set of all elements which map into x via this map x, uh, the map f, excuse me. Now, one has to be a little bit careful, right? Because although x is a subset of b, there could be things in the codomain for which nothing maps to it. And so who's going to map to that little x there? Well, maybe it's no one. It could be that the pre-image of a non-empty set could be empty, depending on the function. Um, and also, there could be multiple elements which map to these elements, in, multiple elements in A that map to things inside of x. And so if you take the pre-image of a single element inside of the codomain, that could be empty if nothing maps onto it, or it could be multiple elements if there's a lot going on there. We'll see some examples and play around with these things in the not too distant future here. Uh, one thing I do also wanna make, if you see the, the set A to the B, so we take our, sorry, B to the A, excuse me, I read that backwards, order matters here. So we have a set B and superscript itself is a set. This is gonna be the, the set of all functions of the form A to the B. Uh, a, a flows to B right here. And so this might seem a little bit backwards. The A comes second as the superscript. And the reason for that's the following. If A is a finite set, which contains A many elements, and B is a finite set that contains B little elements, then the set 
b to the a, which is the set of functions from a to b, it'll contain b to the a many elements. And as usual, this denotes the cardinality of the sets here. And basically the idea is the following. If you have a finite set right here and a finite set right here, here's a, here's b, we have some objects in the domain, do, 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 right? We have to make a choice like, okay, a, this one has to go here, this one has to go here, this one has to go here, something. So for each element in the domain, we have to make a choice about how many, where should those things go, right? So for the first element, you have B options. For the second element, you have B options. For the third element, you have B options, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so you're, how many, if you put all those together, because these are independent choices for your general function, you're gonna have B times B times B times B times B. How many Bs are there? Uh, well, there's A many Bs, and that's B to the A right there. Uh, so let's look at some examples of functions. Now, I'm gonna start off with some examples we might've seen from calculus, because that's probably one of our first exposures or at least in a pre calculus functions. So in, in calculus, we often define functions using formulas and this is sort of a poor way of doing it. So we might say something like f of x equals x cubed and g of x equals e to the x. The reason why I say this is a poor way of defining a function is this doesn't specify the domain or codomain of the function, which is an important concept. Uh, but ignoring that issue for the moment, when you define a function by a formula, what you mean is if you take any number in the, in the domain, like say for the first one, if you want to take say three, f of three is just defined to be evaluate the formula where all the x's are replaced with your input right here, this three. So we get three cubed, which equals 27. So f of three is 27. Um, for example, f of two would equal eight, two cubed. Um, if you wanted to work with the function g, g of zero would be e to the zero, which is equal to one. So it gives us, uh, the formula gives us how we evaluate the function, but it turns out that specifying the domain does actually make sort of an important thing. And now in calculus, they usually follow the domain convention, which says that you define the domain to be the set of real numbers for which the formula is well-defined. Um, unless stated otherwise. So for the function f, you would probably say something like, I'm taking all real numbers. And then what's the output? What's the codomain? Well, in calculus, you typically set the codomain to equal the range, but then you have to figure out what the range is. For x cubed, uh, you can get away with all real numbers. Uh, for g though, right, you can take in all real numbers as your input, but the output, well, for exponential, the output would only be positive reals, so you could end up with zero to infinity, right? But you could also, let's call this g1, you could also take g2 to be the function where you take input as reals and you output a real. The fact that our function, the exponential function doesn't hit every real number, doesn't actually forbid the codomain from being all real numbers. And I should mention that these two functions, g1 and g2, are considered different functions. Uh, because their codomains are, are different. It doesn't matter if they're derived by the same formula because a function is a rule between two sets, the domain and the codomain. If you switch the domain or the codomain, the two functions are automatically different functions. And if the two functions have the same domain and codomain, they'll be equal if the rule is the same, if the set of ordered pairs is all the same. And so, I mean, again, in the context of calculus, the domain and codomain are usually not stated, but we kind of choose do we kind of choose the domain to be maximal and the and the codomain to be minimal? This can get into some problems, right? Um, let's say we take the function f1. You know, we might say something like f of x equals 1 over x. Well, in this situation, again, you typically would probably take the domain to be all numbers except for 0. That's kind of the biggest allotment you could use there. And then you take as the output, well, well it would have to be kind of, the biggest you could choose would be something like this. Zero is not an output there. But this should be specified with the function. Calculus keeps this somewhat ambiguous. Um, if we did something like a square root, square root of x, uh, in that situation, calculus, if you want sort of like the maximal domain, you would take zero to infinity. And this is mostly so that the output is also real. That's part of that domain convention. In, in real value calculus, you want all input and output to be real numbers. So for the square root, even though the square root of negative one is defined, its, out, its output wouldn't be a real number. So we end up with something like this. So using tricks and other observations, we can uh, come up with a, an appropriate domain or codomain. But be aware, switching the codomain and domain does actually change the function. 
Um, and so this will be much more important as we talk about functions being surjective or injective. We'll get to that in a moment. Cautious about when it comes to functions is the idea about being well-defined. Because after all, a function is a relation. It's a subset of the ordered pair of, of, the, of the Cartesian product. Now, a relation is a function because a, a function, a relation, it, sorry, a relation is, a function is a relation and a relation is a set because the relation by definition is a subset of a Cartesian product. So as such, you have to make sure the definition of, of the function, which is a set, is well-defined. And so you have issues like the following. If one tried to define a function from the rational numbers to the integers, one might define the following situation. F of P over Q equals P. That is, we'll just record the numerator. But what happens when you take two different representations of the same rational number? One half and two fourths are considered the same rational number. But if you take f of one half, it should give you a one. f of two fourths should be two. So if those things are truly equal to each other, we should expect that the mapping um, would be the same or relevant. So this is the concern about this function is not well defined. And this, this happens a lot in particular with equivalence relationships, right? If our set is a set of equivalence classes, we want to make sure that our definition doesn't depend on the representative, but it depends on the class itself. And this will equivalence relationships in a future lecture. But as we've likely seen this before, I don't think it's too obnoxious to bring it up right now. One should be very cautious when we define a function. We have to make sure that it is well-defined.